Um, tonight's talk is for the love of woman and a celebration of Mother's Day. I really wanted tonight, because I think a lot of times, I, I've spent a, a lifetime studying these things and they're quite fascinating, but it all comes back to this fundamental question of how do we live these things? How do we actually integrate them? You can have all a wonderful philosophical senses of things, but how do we humanize them? And that's why I wanted to start with Carla and I tonight, because most of my lectures just jump into the feminine divine, but I was thinking that really what I've learned from Carla, from my daughters, from the women in my life, is this relationship to the etiquette of energy. Meaning, it's nothing is denied us, but we have to learn about how we treat, not simply ourselves, but our inner selves. Because this relationship of she who healed my soul, is very important because much of the struggle we have as human beings, as men, is the unforgivable nature inside of us. Something we did that is tragically scarring and unforgivable. And we don't carry that as a person. We carry that as a weave. So we're not just dealing with, in a sense, the sorrows of Eve and Adam as something in the past, but we wear those sorrows of Eve and Adam. The, the problem is not with us in this time. We are the outcome of these problems expressed once again in this time as us. And that's why for my questions, I could not have answered any of these things had I not found home, had I not found Carla. People ask about upstairs, they say, did you do a lot of hallucinogenics? I said, I didn't need to, I was already out there. I needed to find Carla. I needed to find home. I needed to find stability. I didn't need to get more imaginative. I needed to find what do I do with this imagination because it's making me crazy. Because I live in a world that doesn't care about any of these things and when I open my mouth I find people put their eyes up and say, oh dear, there it goes again. So a lot of this became at least where I live. This matters. And that's why I think so much of what's been missing, and this is a lot of the final key, is about intimacy. It's about the arts of being human. Because art is where we resolve things not by what we are opposed to, but by taking those things that are in opposition, we resolve them with creative application. That's why when we're sad and we turn it into a song, we share it with others. Not to amplify our sadness, but in the act of allowing it to be an expression. We share it in a way that lifts not only our spirits, but allows the others to hear it as well and share in that. This is a basic understanding of theater. It's a basic understanding of ensemble and of trust. We live in a world that essentially says there is no trust. And so the question for us now becomes, well, where should I begin my trust? And this is the question of relationship, about where we live and looking at each other not to get away from one another, but to understand that where I end and she begins, the conversation deepens because it's neither me nor her. It's another quality that's trying to live through both of us. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the creative act as human beings. And that's why, you know, I wanted to say about family and the mother of our beautiful daughters and the guardian, uh, Sophia of Olandar, because she became, for me, and you'll see this is why you'll see this, relationship, but this inspiration of what is it, and I have to say this happened with when our daughters were born. Uh, you know, I, I remember I had a conversation with Carla and I said, you know, about having children, I said, well, this was long before we had children, but I was really worried that I didn't want to bring children into this world. I said, it's a really miserable place, I don't really know. But once it turned out that we were bringing children into this world, something shifted in me immediately. And I realized it wasn't about my disappointment in the world that mattered. It was this deeper story of life that said, if you allow yourself, you're going on a journey not of expectation, but you're going to grow into something you can't imagine. And that's really what has happened in terms of our journey, because I, in starting also in terms of the personal, this goes back in Kabbalah and in Jewish mysticism, and a lot of different traditions hold this as well, that the Shekinah, the feminine principle, is that which through relationship with woman, man becomes close to, that he must have it with her because she is what attracts the Shekinah. This is why home was so important. Home, if you think of a tree, if you can't find home, you cannot find your roots. If you do not honor your roots, you do not nourish the tree. So therefore, 
I bring you into relationship with me to remind you of the truth of life. This is why when people say, well, why didn't women study Kabbalah? They didn't need to. They are the Kabbalah. Men need to study these things because we need to create codes and forms and bridges <laughs> that allow us to go, yes, I understand that thing called birth. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's the great factor of humility. And that's why as we jump into the knowledge of Sophia, we're going to begin with this great journey of the great mother Sophia and Philo Sophia, which is also the story of the great romance and the great betrayal. One of the, the stories that, that we have to ask ourselves is what happened. What happened to the time of the goddess, the time of our connection of direct knowing, and why? Because when we think about Sophia, think of the word philosophy, philosophia, wisdom, the mother. She says, I'm the knowledge of your atoms. There are no evil atoms. Tell me a story of life because life includes all. So Sophia was wisdom, and our great traditions, our early traditions were based on this type of knowing. Because it said if part of the tribe is sick, the whole tribe is sick. The tree must heal not parts of itself, but the whole and holy nature of itself. We are expressions like an acting troupe of different qualities and conditions. We play different roles for one another, but the reason we're here together is we need one another. We have, to a great degree, forgotten that on our journey away from Sophia, away from philosophy, away from philosophia, the love of wisdom. Essentially, we have the opposite, the fear of wisdom, which is, I want my opinion, I want it to be powerful, and I want it to be strong enough to knock yours down. Doesn't sound like a loving relationship. Sounds like a combative ego problem. But this is also why I think it's very important tonight that when we think about these qualities, we're not really thinking about just girl and boy. It really, as Jung would say, these are intrapsychic principles. The battle of the masculine and feminine is inside of ourselves. And the idea of patriarchy, that's why I'm going to spend a little, uh, few minutes just looking at this question of Lilith patriarchy. When did woman become the evil woman, the fallen Eve? When did Adam become the innocent Adam, corrupted by the fallen Eve? And then we have the end of the age of the mother and the end of the age of goddess worship. It's very important to realize in the Old Testament when the Moabites and the Canaanites are smited or smote or whatever the word is, those were goddess worshipers. So essentially we're, we're beginning at that point to get rid of the goddess. And we're going to do that also with, uh, with Alexander and, and Greece in Macedonia because we're going to replace the Pythoness, the, the feminine ancestral line, with now the, the followers of Apollo. So they will be put into service of the male god, no longer in service to the serpent goddess, the, the mother goddess, the earth goddess. And it's a very interesting thing if we don't look at this as who was the good guy or the bad guy any more than you're looking at a script, you say, oh, I get it. They're all really different characters of a much larger conversation. And that's why as we move into the age of separation, we're going to see this conflict between two streams, the love and the fear of woman. And that oftentimes when we talk about patriarchy, people have a type of blanket statement. It's a one thingness. Or I say, well, what do you mean by it? And they go, well, I don't know. Uh, I just don't like it. Um, <laughs> and that's why we've got to realize that in the esoteric and the exoteric, in the exoteric religions, we have outer forms and formal beliefs that we follow. In the esoteric, these are the inner traditions. These are the Sufi. These are the ones that says it is inward. This is about direct knowing. This is about direct connection. If you're a performer, this is about embodied performance, meaning I can't know this character over there. It's not a matter of belief. It's not a matter of faith. It's a matter if I don't know this directly, I don't know this. And this is where when we understand that also going back to ancient times with our symbols of the living tree, of the vase, of the womb. Everything was based on this ways of love and responsibility with the mother, with Eve. Now the father is the exoteric uh, traditions, which are the ways of law and duty. And if you think about our psyches, we're born of a mother and a father. So we're born of these qualities that are seemingly adverse to each other. One is the outer world, which is the relationship of toughness and form, and one is the inner world, this relationship of vulnerability and creative sensitivity. And that's why just in terms of, uh, I categorize them, but, but to a certain degree, Gnostic is direct knowing, 
Sophia, our eternal mother, is the basis of hermetic, alchemical, and mystical traditions. That's why when you look at alchemical imagery, the mother is so predominant. When you read uh, 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 Sufi poetry and you read troubadour poetry, you read all of it is really honoring of woman. We're going to read a little bit, just a few snippets of those things, because I want to bring that in. Because here she is the first principle. She's prima materia. She is mater mater mother. She's the grail mystery. She is what really is in courtly romantic love, which comes up in the Middle Ages, was this whole idea that you, you pick a woman beyond your caste that you cannot have, so that she creates an ideal that one must create worthiness for. You see, that's the, we, we have, in a way, a time of soldiers which is you do what you're told. But you have a samurai, Bushido, and Grail Knights. They weren't those qualities of consciousness. They were saying, I will not take anything that I have not earned. I will not defile anything that is of God. And she is of God. So there was a very different etiquette. And this is why we're, it's not one clumped problem. And, the, and, and, and as we step back, we start to see that the Renaissance mind was based upon the cultivation of hermetic wisdom and the veneration of Philosophia, the divine feminine. Her alchemy is transmutation, ensemble, and relationship. And that in uh, alchemy we have the expression solve et coagula, which means to dissolve and recombine. But you think also of something that is alive. It's, it's opening us. And, and closing us, we're in a living thing. And it's the belief in inner authority, creation, art, and beauty. But the ways of patriarchy of the father are orthodox. Orthodox simply means one way. There's one way to do it. And the reason was not because of a type of evil. It was the belief that there were mature and immature souls. And that for a mature soul, you needed to nourish a mature soul with creative and imaginative possibility. Therefore, you would speak of the mystery of Christ. But for immature souls, you speak of orthodoxy. There is one way. This is what's expected of you. Follow these directions, and you'll get to heaven. Do you see? And that's what this cultivated, because it was the eternal father. This became orthodox, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, the, really what are known as the Abrahamic traditions, all going back to Abraham. And they were based upon law and strict obedience and the veneration of external authority, a domination, submission paradigm. And that's what we're coming out of. It's this story that the second principle, not the first principle, see, we don't venerate life. We venerate math. We venerate distance and separation and time. And we venerate that it's not here, it's there. We venerate that the reward is not now, it is then. You see, that's a mind that has projected itself out into the world, but is out without the capacity to come in. That's why if we think of these as interpsychic principles, then the masculine that has had to deal with authority, deal with this world that is based upon these principles, says, but I need you to breathe in to the deep feminine. I need you to breathe back into the heart. I need you to be back, breathe back into this universal quality because she says, I am the eternal mother. And the mother loves all of the creation because she is whole and holy. And she is also that which allows for this relationship to the, the truth that we've been taught, that transfiguration is elsewhere. That, that heaven, nirvana, rapture, are all hierarchies. They're places that are rewards for the outcome of doing something here. And that this helps us understand religion is the politics of manipulation. And that's very important because as soon as we start getting into, I've got a special ticket for you. All I need you to do is this. Do you see? And we start to then develop, oh, this must be what it's about over time because our reward is later. It's about optical mag magic. Don't look at what you're looking at. Look at what I'm telling you you're looking at. And this belief in outer authority is what we're now conflicted with. You know, we're, we're in outer authority and inner authority. And that's why where we are here tonight, as community, within domestic space, as creative individuals, it is that sense, the spinning wheel, this outer patriarchy is spinning and it is what it is. So how do we spin back using that force, that centripetal centrifugal force, so that we remember to breathe. That's the element of the library here. It says, as a library, I want to remind you that your resources are available. But as a library, I don't come to you. You're busy doing this. So I need you to take time to come to me. 
That's a maturing relationship with our imagination as well. And that's what helps us understand what Jung was saying, that the soul of humanity is like a great wheel of the zodiac that rolls along the way. Everything that comes up in a constant movement to the heights was already there. There is no part of the wheel that does not come round again. This really helps us understand our time. Looking down, saying, why are we here again at this time? What is the point? And that's what we forget, to include sort of like a detective. Why am I here? <laughs> we usually go, I'm not supposed to be here, and it's not now, it's later, because the way we've been taught. But he says, to give birth to the ancient in a new time is creation. And that's why I wanted to add our dear Joseph Campbell, who said, the artists of every generation must reinvigorate the myths. This is the call to all storytellers and artists that the problem with belief is you have to defend belief. And once you have to defend belief, it's no longer about what you're talking about. It's about the defense of that thing. And so that's where theater and storytelling is in a way deeply subversive because it says, let's not have that argument. Let's move over here and be very inspired together because if we're inspired, believe me, that energy is going to be attractive much more interesting than our argument, because we're sitting here playing the guitar, right? We're starting to sing some blues. We're starting to play music. We're starting to do something that's changing that frequency. And that's why I'm so convinced that, that if you think about our form, about the flower, as I say, going from a bud to a blossom, it doesn't destroy its infrastructure. We begin to hold our energy differently. And I believe that the artist consciousness, because when you look at the library and you think, Man, all of these artists are, they have their butts kicked. I mean, nobody cares about what they do. Everyone either thinks they're crazy or if they can't sell it, they're no longer relevant. Do you know, they're really tor tormented for the most part, no matter how famous they seem to be. And that became the deeper story of, of the artist saying, listen, I was not rewarded in my life. You might see great reward, but what I thought was costly, it was much easier to be asleep, <laughs> much easier. But instead, I stayed awake, even though it was painful. And that's the heroism of who we are. You know, in spite of this, we add to it. In spite of the fact that we're going to be executed for freedom of thought, or love, or I care, again. And I really feel like that's in our soul. A weariness of, I can't keep doing this. I keep, can't keep going into a world that goes, everything that you believe in isn't going to happen here. But that's also the strategy of the artist going, you can't take this away from me. You can take everything else away from me. You cannot take my journal away from me. You cannot take my ability to write away from me. You can't take my ability to paint away from me. You cannot take the things that truly matter. You can take property, you can take lives, yes, but you cannot take the soul. And I think that that's why the veneration of the soul and the mother and the ancestors is, that's where you live. You're a tree that has emerged into this body. You're not trying to find yourself. You're trying to align with self. And that's where, as we move, we have to take a look at the sacrifice of the goddess, the ancient one, Lilith and Sophia and Eve, the three faces of woman and goddess. Now, I always show upstairs, but this is very important because Lilith manifested upstairs in the hieroglyph of the human soul. I was not expecting to tell her story, but this helps us understand when we talk about the divine feminine or the feminine divine, we talk about the goddess, we talk about these different qualities, that when they come up through art as they have here, they're not the illustration of something that we need to know, but actually the outcome of a deeper relationship of love that says, now that you've loved me deeply enough, let me reveal this as well. Because the key to our truth is that whatever we love deeply, I don't care whether it's botany or math, whatever we love deeply will reveal the nature of reality to us in the language that we love, because that's love for us. And think about it from the quality of the imagination going, yeah, I don't want just the math love or just the botany love or just the artist love. I want it all. I want to know what the gold is inside of the tile layer, the street cleaner. I want to know what the gold is inside of the person that climbs mountains, the person that loses their life in war. I want to know these things. And if you think of ourselves as the willingness to keep coming downstairs, to keep coming into the world, to say, yeah, I'll take that one. <laughs> sure, that question, that part, I'll take that one. I'll do that. And you start thinking as a type of ensemble group, wow, we're pretty amazing. Because we started to realize that I thought it was just about me, but no, no, no. 
It's about all of us as the outcome of this great turning inward that began, as we see, with the Venus of Volendorf, and we start to see early, uh, when we're in this time of the caves, everything is connected. The mother is, of course, absolute fertility. The weave, she doesn't need eyes because the weave is all. I am the living weave. I am central truth. I am that which is always pregnant, always life. So feel my fullness like a peach. I'm about to burst. You see? <laughs> this is, comes from also the Chinese way of painting. There's a marvelous thing about painting a pine cone. You must paint it right when it is about to burst. <laughs> Capture that. That's the, uh, the actor's truth. And that's why as we look into fear, dark matter, mater, mother, we have Lilith and the succubus, the demoness, the seductress, the murderess, the femme fatale, the first woman, the goddess, and why? And this is where we're going to start just to look a little bit at, again, Lilith. Because Lilith, I realized in what has emerged here, is the end of the age of the goddess. It's the end of the age of direct knowing. That forever after she turns herself inward, we are going to have a separation in our psyche between love and thought, yin and yang. So that when we ask questions about time and form, it will be one answer. When we ask questions about love and meaning, it will be another. We will be separated until we realize that those two questions aren't really separated, but essentially that the relationship a piano has to music. That the one question can't be answered <laughs> until the piano is built. And that's what the mother's going to tell us. She's going to say, you've been building a piano for a very long time, but you can't play the instrument until you all return to me. And that's the truth of this greater instrument. And this is why when we see in Notre Dame, notice the serpent here, Lilith, between Adam and Eve, and temptation. Now it's so interesting because in this story we start to see, of course, Mary and Christ rising from the, the, the base of Lilith and the Garden of Eden. And we'll see that from this base we're shooting an arrow like, I'm getting away from here. Um, but if you think about this as a development of a being that is stepping up from these roots, in a sense, stretching away, because they're not really separated, right? They're in relationship to each other. They're separated in time, but not in the larger building, the larger relation. That's why the Gothic cathedral is so important, because she says, my truth is not fixed. The truth I reveal is the relationship your eye has with me every time you look at me, because you never look at me the same way twice. That's truth. And that's why when she says, in, uh, of course, in, in uh, Michelangelo's painting, we have, have Lilith once again. But we even see how the serpent is intertwined with the tree, with nature. So there's this beginning to fear nature, pantheism. Anything connected to nature and woman, ultimately creation and earth, will be seen as that which separates us from God in the heavens. And uh, the other, I love some of these uh, illustrations, again, of, of Lilith and the seductress, this relationship of going deeply into the, the, the psyche, and we start to see the succubus and the nightmares and the relationship of how the, the turbulent psyche. Here we see the succubus coming in, of course. This, this is what you might say bad press. Um. <laughs> <laughs> See, once Lilith lost her, uh, her, because she was not willing, in the, the tradition, she was not willing to lie under Adam. She wouldn't say, yeah, I don't know what I know. And she said, I can't pretend. I know what I know, and I'm not going to pretend. Thank you very much. I'm not going to lie under Adam. So that's a little bit too uh, self-important for what's coming after, which is, uh, wait a minute. No, no, no. We want you to understand that as we push you away to make a more suppliant being, but actually on a deeper level, this is the age of the goddess being uh, pushed away and the beginning of the human story. Because the succubus becomes that which sucks the soul out of a man as he is near death. She appears as a beautiful image and then of course he goes to touch her and she becomes a demon and takes him down into hell. That's why I say Lilith has had really bad press because she essentially then became the, the instrument by which everything was used to say, don't trust woman, she will eat your babies. Don't trust woman, she will, uh, she will betray you. Don't trust woman. So everything, if we look at that as a psychological tool, is saying if you can sever that connection, if you can sever that root, 
you can turn people toward authority because they won't be able to go back to that place of knowing. And if you turn it into something evil, they won't want to go back to that place of knowing. But if you think about that as a game plan going, it's going to seem really awful for a long time, but we couldn't go back because we were going to ask a fundamentally different set of questions. All of our ancient traditions were based upon alignment. This is why you have the totem pole, you have the relationship of the Maori with is saying we are our ancestors, we are in time, but we are drawing up into this field. That's very important to know because that's the relationship of our ancient sites. They were about alignment and amplification, like theater bringing actors together, saying we're going to lift one another. But once we knocked the obelisk down, once we bent into time and slowed all that down, we became very afraid of direct connection because we were leaving it. We were going on a very great journey away. And that's why, uh, you know, and this is Munch's vampire, but I, you know, when, when uh, <laughs> I said, this really reminds me of my early work, um, uh, I'm not comparing myself to Munch, I love Munch, um, but it's that sense of the going deeply into the unconscious. What is this uh, place of despair? of death, of disconnection. And now what's really interesting because I thought when I put this love of woman, mother, gnosis, direct experience, mystery, knowledge of union, life, matter, mater, mother, I love, therefore I am, it's very hard when your mind is here. Do you know this is the self-image, right? I'm not lovable, I'm dead, or my blood's being sucked out of me. You know, it's, and that's one of the, the difficulties is that inside of ourselves oftentimes we have an intellectual appreciation but emotionally, we're very shut down because it, we don't seem worthy of these energies. We've done something wrong. We don't feel that we're able to embrace them. And that's why, as we look into the gift of, of art, it starts to say many of the things that will help resolve us are not in words. They really are in a picture language. They're in the qualities like music that tell us, I can teach you only so much. But what I'm teaching you to do is to trust yourself. In other words, I'm teaching you about the piano, but I want you to play it. I want you to improvise because the piano will be your mentor. You learn the keys and you learn the, the approach so you can finally be free of it. And that's this great sense of the Empress because she's, she is matter, mater, mother. She's the gate into this world, but she's going to be, she's also Sophia, the heavenly mother, the gate of the divine. And the moon will take us deeper into the mystery of the blood, into corporeal wisdom, and the fall of the ego into time and death, and the rising once again through the knowledge of the blood. This is what this is very important because part of what we don't understand is because we have a very superficial reading of ourselves, we don't think of ourselves like trees with depth. We think of ourselves sort of as logs laying on our side going, well, I was there and I'm going there and all I feel like is firewood. Um, <laughs> that the whole point of the archetypes and of these stories is, again, to bring us back. Now think, think, of, think of being in a type of sleep where all around you are laying these tools. But they're not tools that reach out and say, I'm going to tell you. They wait for you to say, hmm, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. In that curiosity, they begin to, it's a bit like approaching a character as an actor. You do not know how to play a character. You have no idea what it means. You start rehearsal, you start rehearsing, you start memorizing, you start playing, you start exploring. And then finally, at some mysterious point, a character starts to grow in you. You start to know it, you start to feel it, you start to know when you're in character. You can know because it feels a completely different universe than the one you inhabit. And I really feel that this is important because this takes us back to shape-shifting. It takes us back to understanding the power of the psyche, to open to the qualities greater than itself, to move into those psychological spaces, but like an actor, not to be swept away by them. And a lot of this knowledge remains dormant because we are so afraid of madness. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. It's, it's like if I go through that door, in a way, <laughs> luckily, I went mad in a, you know, in a, in a way that, that, that became beautiful, uh, you know, but I have to say the first few years, friends of mine were looking at me going, uh, Carla, is uh, Lee getting out enough? <laughs> 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 and, but something was, was driving me, and I kind of feel like that's the deeper sanity underneath the optics, you know, in all of us, that we keep thinking it's this, but there's something that's growing from within to without, and that really is very much the knowledge of the moon. This is one of, I, I highly suggest this in my book, 
it's an extraordinary uh, um, chapter because like the drawing itself, I had no intention of telling this story. So like an archaeologist, as I kept going deeper and deeper and deeper, I went, whoa, this is way more interesting than I thought. <laughs> and I kind of feel like that's going to be the aha moment of a lot of us on the planet. We're going to go, wow, this is way more interesting than we've been thinking. You know, we keep going, I got it. And it's like, I step back a while and I'm going, this is very, and that's why synchronicity, a lot of these other languages are saying, slow down, listen. It's not going to be in the world of the outer. That's like if you think of the tarot, right? Think of all of these spinning, like a, like a gyroscope, meaning that that's the ring of Saturn. That's your structure. So it's always there. But it's not to over-identify with it, any of it now, but to actually stand in the strength of it and to realize you're the outcome of it. And then, like an actor with archetype, I can play a devil or an empress or an emperor with equal facility because I realize that they're not, not me. There are other parts of myself, other books in the library that I can access and that I can still return to my linoleum world. You know, that's important because I really think that a lot of times our creative spirit was looked at as a way away. If I can get really successful, I don't have to deal with these responsibilities. I can have other people do it for me. I can live my life elsewhere. I don't have to ever be home. Now think of that as a relationship with the creative spirit. You don't ever have to be home. You're going to get rich off of me. Why? What's this type of relationship sound like to you? And I really do feel like that's the gardener's sense. It has to matter here now, not here. And that's why as we look into the, the story that really takes us into the high priestess, this quote from the Thunder Perfect Mind Gnostic text, with it, which if you have not read it, Thunder Perfect Mind, Google it. It's an extraordinary talk from the feminine uh, divine and her story about the nature of who and what she is. She says, I am the union and the dissolution. I am the abiding and I am the, uh, I am the union and the dissolution. I am the abiding and I am the dissolution. I am the one below and they come up to me. I am the judgment and the acquittal. I, I am sinless and the root of sin derives from me. Oh, koans. Um, <laughs> but it's very important because this duality helps us understand with the feminine the mystery of mysteries, the prima materia. I am she who can never be known or unveiled. I am the source of all being. Now if you think about that not as an abstract, but as an energy, this is why I would always joke with Carl. I said, I'm going to <laughs> take, um, this is a drawing that has to do with the transmutation of the mysteries from dark matter into matter. How do you draw that? Well, of course you can't, but that's why I love actors. You can get actors together in an improvisation class and you go, all right, Shetland ponies, everybody. They'll do it. <laughs> you know, whatever a Shetland pony is inside of an actor, they can do it, which I've always loved about creative people. It's like, I can do that, you know. <laughs> and, and I kind of feel like that's the key to consciousness, that willingness to show up and go, I can do that. Might be kind of fun. I don't know, it sounds a little crazy, but I'm up for it. You know, it's, it, and that's, that's the cleverness of this reemergence of the great mother, Sophia Eve Lilith in art and creation and modern storytelling. I don't have uh, a lot of this, but I wanted to put up a little bit of, of my, the story Adam Reborn and Eve Restored, a romance in two parts. Again, like the upstairs, again, like the tarot, again, like everything I've done, I was not expecting to tell this story. But I began painting Eve, and the reason I wanted to include it tonight is it really started to deepen my sense of where we might be from. And that it was coming from beauty, it was coming from art, and it was coming from a deeply personal relationship. I felt I would listen. And what she told me was really, really beautiful because she said, um, the seeded dreams of Sophia are fashioned to trigger the eternal imagination, to draw forth depths of artistry and knowledge through birth, wonder, and creative stars. Adam's seeded dream leavens his nascent curiosity, vitalizing his vision into infinite currents of divine probability. Sophia, upon feeling universal Adam's anguish beneath the crushing burden of time's complexities, begins to cry. Her tears flow into each of Adam's worlds <laughs> each of Adam's atomized realities. From Sophia's tears of wisdom, this is what really surprised me beautifully. 
From Sophia's tears of wisdom and love, her daughter, the Immaculate Eve, rises uniquely into each of Adam's worlds. And this is Eve. You can tell that she, uh, if thine eye be single. <laughs> so as she told me this story, she said, Eve is the heart of Splendor's garden. If you remember upstairs, I showed you the, the, go the mother, the goddess on the floor, that's Splendor. She said, Eve is the heart of Splendor's garden. Within worlds of time, she is paradise, the center of being and the divine mirror of this earthly Adam's home, which Adam and his Eve call Eden. For the first time, fear overcomes universal Adam, and that fear simultaneously darkens all of his newly emerging worlds. Fear obscures his umbilical connection within the divine womb of Sophia, and now universal Adam feels lost as Adam scattered across unthinkably vast emptiness. Eve is the great mother of generation within the womb of all women. Her umbilical connection to life, natural beauty, and loving wisdom becomes within fear-filled worlds of universal Adam a serpent that lives in shadow and kills without conscience, a serpent thought evil, condemning one to live in time alone and absent from God's love and his wonders in the great elsewhere. In Eve's condemnation and rejection, all mothers cry. Eve is crucified in all of Adam's worlds, nailed to an unmoving cross of blame and contempt. The sacred dies, nature is ignored, and priestcraft is born with the counting of days rather than the realizing of dreams. Universal Adam in all of his beings and generations feels condemned to wander alone. Out of shame, Adam's worlds refuse to look into the eyes of his beloved. And Lilith, and, and uh, that's part of the story. It goes on very beautifully, and it's about really Lilith, as, as though always present, has been hidden until now. And so we see her behind the blossom, revealing herself, showing that I have not really left. I have been waiting for you to have a relationship that allows me to be seen because I am your erotic, your sensual, your ancient knowing. I dissolve the illusion of the illusion. This is why narcissists are really scared of Lilith, because she devours narcissism. It's based upon mere knowledge. It's not based upon energetic knowledge. And that's, that's where we're at in, in the world because she's emerging. It's fascinating. It's not optical, it's energetic. It's the dissolution of old agreements that are disappearing when you don't realize how. She's dissolving them. That's the energy here. And that this was then back to the text, the ways of life and death have not a thing to do with time. The ins and outs of worlds are portals, not time frames. Wombs, not objects and loving vision, not judgment. And that's why we see, again, this relationship of Eve and the blossom. And she says, rejoice, and this is what the end of the book was, for the moment of awakening is here. The cathedral of human knowledge is known. Eve is restored and her earthly Adam reborn. Whew. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> that's also why in terms of love and the hidden side, and let's bring it into mothership and we'll finish it up, because I wanted to also bring in this relationship to the divine and the feminine and woman and the tradition of alchemy and the troubadours because the relationship of Our Lady, now listen to this, this is the troubadour, the beloved one is the heart's highest grail. Her lover will not be alone for she is to him the highest grail, which protects from every woe. So do you see, that's that yearning. May I find her who envelops me, who finally is that true protective nature, which is life, not the artifice of armor. I'm strong outwardly. That's why I say man protects the body, woman protects the soul. And this is very important, I think, for our storytelling because the veneration of Sophia, woman, Eve, Mother in alchemy, hermeticism, Gnosticism, perennial philosophy, mystical tradition, Kabbalah, magic, the arts, and ancient worlds. So this is not something new. This is something that is moving through uh, our generations like Robert Flood here, going back to the 1600s and the last great hermetic philosopher. But here we see Sophia once again. Do you see the mother of creation holding the monkey who's measuring the world essentially, man's nature? This, this, this mind that is caught in all of these forms, 
but she is the gate to heaven. And this is very important for us in terms of our imagination because it's again an intrapsychic relationship that allows us to see and what's so brilliant for these things is we realize also in history that we have been dealing with visually these questions for a very long time and that when we start to introduce them back into our thinking we say well this makes a lot more sense because again we see this very the triumph of Venus but look at this do you see all of her sex and it's all coming into all of the different nights in the forest so essentially, when we think about the Vesica Pisces, why is, is Christ always in the shape of the Yoni? It's because that is the birth of feminine gnosis or wisdom within masculine expression. Think of yin-yang, the white within the black and the black within the white. It's the perfect balance. That's why all of our Gothic cathedrals are not based on the, the dome, like St. Peter's, which is about power, but two intersecting spheres. Do you see that? Because it's heaven and earth coming together and life. And that was the point. It was neither one nor the other. But in the balance of both, we could be restored to how to navigate the world, being restored to our deeper principles that we could never see. But then let's say a great cathedral, we could feel that energy. And then we walk out and go, oh, it's back to the Holy Lands, another crusade. Great, Richard. <laughs> but. The second. Um, uh, <laughs> the mystery, um, this I also put in from, because uh, I thought it was important from the mystery of sex about the Holy Kabbalah, that the mystery is that the mother of transcendence aids in the male only insofar as he has constitu constituted him, himself a house by his attachment to the female. There must be local habitation, a union below to offer a point of contact with the union that is on high. And the Divine Mother pours down her blessings therefrom, that is to say, on male and female in equal measures. So is the male below said to be encompassed by two fe females and all the ways of blessing in the worlds are open to him. He, and I love this part. He reads the secret doctrine in the womanhood on earth and it is read to him by her who sits between the pillars of the eternal temple with the book of the secret law lying on her sacred knees. That attitude would get you some clue as to maybe there is this relationship, this sense. And from Nivalis, and I thought this was so interesting, this is a, such a wonderful old uh, alchemical emblem as well, because they know not that it is thou who hauntest the bosom of the tender maiden and makes a heaven in her lap. Never suspect it, thou, the portress of heaven that steppeth to meet them out of ancient stories, bearing the key to the dwellings of the blessed, silent messenger of secrets infinite. That's, that's very important. This, this relationship, we'll even see in the transformation of the king. We see them in the water. He's on top of her, in the water. But through this relationship of Shekinah, this relationship of the feminine, she is she absorbs him, do you see, and they have wings. So they can fly together. It's that sense of they have wings that finally, and there's a shift. That, and I really think that that's the yin yang, the sense of turning, like a martial art, this capacity to hold these qualities that say, now I awake, for now I am thine and mine. Thou hast made me know the night and brought her to my life. Thou hast made me a man. Consume my body with the ardor of my soul, that I may be turned to finer air, may minger, mingle more closely with thee, and then our bridal night endure forever. Novalis. <laughs> and again, this sense of the restoring, bringing uh, man out of the, the swamp. Uh, <laughs> that's a different connotation these days. Um, <laughs> into the, oh, sorry, the, um, this uh, story, of, uh, again, this relationship of the, the conjoining of the union of male and female in the alchemical process to bring forth the alchemical sun and moon, the realization of the perfected male and female. Because this is key, is that in this union is what? The waters of life. Only in this human, in this relationship, is life brought forth. And that's very important because that's also a philosophical question. Are these elements in what you're saying? Because if they're not all there, you bring forth material, but it's dead. 
I want to know it's alive. And I really think that that's when you read something and you go, whoa, it's because it has this in it. It's just by nature. It has this essential uh, balancing of this birth, uh, a holy birth, and then the exalted king and queen in the bath, and the dove of peace. But also you see the cross, they're holding all of these qualities together. And that was really the ideal of alchemy, of the great work was the balancing of the male and female, but also the reverence that the female is the transmutive element of the work. She is the secret. Life is the secret. And we've turned it into a study, which in a way makes it something we're never going to actually understand because it's like reading a symphony and not understanding the purpose of the notes. Love makes us <coughs> understand the purpose of the notes. By falling in love, the mystery reveals itself. And that's why, in terms of the relationship here with the visions of Hildegard and the spheres, she, back in a very long time ago, in, in the 1000s, 1100s, she said that within the woman I perceive the lineaments of the human form, and as through a funnel the grand high craftsman drew a wanderer, an orb, drawn into that form and womb, and from this union the human soul is born. Which is an interesting thing, again, to think about, in terms of the embodiment of the soul. And here's, this is her painting. This idea of being drawn down, and we see it coming down into the woman down below, and we see the infant. And these stages, because we're looking at the soul. Now what's very fascinating here is these started to manifest in my studio. And they will lead to the last part, mothership, because often when this relationship, and you see Carla, <laughs> there was the orb manifestation that, that, that happened when she was we were reading a, a thing on Gurdjieff and Carla said, get the camera, you've got to take a picture, I see something. And we saw these astounding orbs coming out and spiraling out of the, the painting that creates the mandalas. So when we think about not communication, but communion, think about love. I didn't have to say it, I knew it because it awakened. Think about a point in storytelling that says, because this helps us understand crop circles. I'm not going to stick around, this isn't a whodunit. And if you think it's a whodunit, you're going to miss the point completely. It doesn't matter who done it. Be curious about what's been done. And that's why I'm convinced a lot of things that show up in this house show up because they say, at least here they'll pay attention. And I feel with a lot of us, it's probably true about a lot of you, right? Something showed up because I'm sure it probably said, are you available? Nobody's paying attention to any of this. And that helps you understand the custodial and guardian nature of when these things do show up. They expect you to do something with them. And that's why you can see them coming down from this, but they're coming down from paintings of minds which had been invoking orbs because they, again, had been uh, in relationship to orbs. But what's amazing is, now we go back to Hildegard, we realize this is not a current conversation. This is a very old conversation with a current chapter. It helps us understand what this is trying to get at. You know, it's not separating, saying, oh, guess what, you arrived without roots. It's like saying, no, this is a conversation that keeps rising. And look at how they're coming. I mean, it's really quite extraordinary. And you can see in the background the mandalas and the phoenix, but you start to see that all over are these orbs. And if you look closely at them, you'll realize they have hieroglyphs in them, they have eyes in them, they have faces in them. And that's why in my, my codex, then, I started to take the ideas as an artist. I said, I can't know these things directly, but I'm not going to prove or disprove. I, I find those conversations ridiculous. You know, oh, this is just dust. I go, it's interesting dust then. Let's <laughs> jump off. <laughs> you know, it's like, I can't believe how many people cut themselves off from an interesting life. Well, it's not that. Do you ever think it is that? <laughs> and that's why in the codex, the sense of where these things took me, I started to apply the artist's model. If something shows up, I'm going to put it down. And that's why it took me deeper and deeper into the question of what is this orb and what are the ancestors. And they show up more and more as a visual reference point saying, and I really feel it is, kids, you know enough. Trust your imagination. Trust what a picture book does for you. There's no right way to interpret a picture. There's that which inspires you. And if you're inspired, you're much more interesting to other people. It changes the whole world. <laughs> it's a simple uh, uh, martial arts, and this is why I also <laughs> wanted to show the relationship of how we have geometrization of the spheres. We also have this very funny relationship. I painted this, as we can see, with the orb and the circle little face. That is exactly what is here, the orb, the circle, and that little face. It's also showing a line, as there's a line here, and there are 3D glasses, and you'll start to see there are two eyes. Now, if that's not funny, 
you know, like, like I, I want to communicate with you. I'm going to put these little eyes next to so, so I can show you that we're communicating. This started to teach me about why a lot of things that happen don't have a context. But once we create a context, we can realize we're actually in a different level of communion. And that's art. Because I'm convinced our art communion is where we are generous. Where we say at the end of the day, I don't want to deprive you of something. I don't want to tell you a story that's at your expense. I don't want to make it about what you're not. I want to make it about what is possible. So we, in a way, breathe more deeply and rise above those conditions that keep us like this. And that is why I do feel that the healing will be in the creative and also in the primary technologies. Not, not the, 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 they will be balanced. Everything here tonight and almost everything we do here, whether it's sound baths or yoga or art, or, is really this, this relationship to the primary storyteller technology. It's not, and I always use Michael Pollan when he was talking about food. I love it. He said, if your grandma doesn't recognize it as food, don't eat it. And I kind of feel like that philosophically. If your ancestors don't recognize it, don't eat it. Put it there, but eat the real stuff, because that'll bring you home. That'll give you seeds, so that'll put you on stage and you have power for a performance. Otherwise, you'll sit in the audience and think, oh, I'm not that. And a lot of this is doing that. I'm not that, I'm not that. This, this. And that's why as we move into the mirror, I have to say that we see a 3D DNA in the mirror. It's not outside of the mirror. So it's very Alice in Wonderland. And we start to see the orbs again manifested as a type of density, and then of course my 3D, the, the, well, my painting, it's in front of the painting that does this. And so I bring it really around finally to Mothership and Revelations in Pink because I thought her story, which comes again from, I was photographing orbs, but then not only orbs, I was photographing light vehicles in my mirror, and they were like this. You can see it almost looks like a, either a black hole or a dreidel. But it was creating something that I said, I'm going to just start painting. So I started putting it in paintings. I'm not going to figure out what it is ahead of time, which is a real big problem with the imagination. Uh, it's not that. It's like the imagination might just be. Shut up for a while. Let it go. <laughs> and that's why with Mothership Revelations in Pink, I started painting her over a period of time, and she appeared with this beautiful story that I think is well worth uh, for Mother's Day celebration and to really bring it to the story she told. She said, I am matter mater mother. I'm the knowledge of your atoms. Your father Adam is the knowledge of your form, but I'm the knowledge of your energy. And I tell you as the mother, I love all of my atoms. There are no evil atoms. If you don't like your stories, try telling better stories. <laughs> try beginning telling a story with where you live, not with what's wrong with the neighbor, but what's right with where you are and with the people you love. And that's really, if you think about the mother going to shake you, shut up, come home. You've been away for a very long time. You've forgotten that you're composed of the whole and holy story. You think you're just these two eyes. I tell you there, this as well. And that's why she says, the belly, she says, I show you the twins, the male and female, and the gift of the apple, the gift of the chalice, the gift of the grail, the alembic of life. Because the truth is that the gift of life is the first principle. And that's her revelation. She says, enough with the revelations in black and white. There's always a good guy and a bad guy. And let me guess, you're the good guy, right? I'm not interested in that conversation. And that's really true if you think about your mom. I'm not interested in how you'd kill your brother, Bill or how you'd kill your sister because you hate her. You know, in a way, these squabbles are inside of our psychology as well. We don't find a centralizing voice that says, calm down, kid, relax. And I think that that's why this house is important because it helps us understand fundamentally a theatrical structure of the psyche. It says, downstairs below, we have the black and white, the archetype, the structure, like a piano, an instrument. This is the knowledge of the father meaning across the ages, through the Byzantine, the Egyptian, the African, the traditional, the, all of these different questions, we have been asking over and over and over again, through all the different lenses of history and time, creating a structure, the father, the potter, the pattern. But if you think of that pattern, to finally hold the above, as it does in this house, then what does it hold upstairs? A library, a multidimensional place of imagination. And they're not really separate here. As above, so below are just different rooms. 
different questions. So the question upstairs is, I want you to come up with an imagination here, because I want you to realize you're part of an amazing story. And I want you to put the glasses on and look at me in more than one way. And I want you to maybe pick up a book you've never even thought about before. And I don't want you to realize that's just as human. And I want you to pick up that book you hate and realize that's just as human. Because at the end of the day, they're just books. So put them back on the shelf because no one book by itself can understand any of the story of the library. It's only when we step back and realize we're part of this great Adam, this great journey of the gift of life and the chalice of wisdom. We are umbilically connected to this. We grow from this. And she says that here we will see the ancestors above. And this great story, again, and this is very important, she says, my crown are not jewels. The mother's crown are tears. Because my question is, what do you do with the sorrow? What do you do with this journey across forever that has an, had an ache in the human heart? What do we do with it? And that's why I had a vision, and I, I, I really need to share this, because on 2011, on the winter solstice, I was standing upstairs and I was taken to uh, the chimney tree, the sequoia that had burned out on the inside. And it stood me in the center of the tree, and I looked up and I said, I said, do you see this? I said, yeah. I said, it's powerful, beautiful. I said, yes. Do you see how it's empty on the inside? And I said, yes. So do you see how ancient fires burned out the inside of this tree a very long time ago? I said, yes. I said, this is the human. So the very ancient fire burned out the insides a long time ago. And like that tree, we've been reaching up for the heavens, yearning higher and higher with always this sense of emptiness. There's something in here that's not there, like a tree hollowed out. But the beauty was it lifted me to the top of the tree and it said, is this not beautiful? I went, yeah, of course it's beautiful. Is this enough? And I said, yes, of course it's enough. He said, good, because this is the human truth. This tree is beautiful in and of itself, but I want to show you something else. And it took me to the top of that chimney tree, and I looked down at what was beautiful. As I could look down, hundreds of feet down, I saw all of these sparks coming from all of these different places. And they came up to a center place, a sphere in the middle of that tree. And it told me that we're building a brain. We've not had, we've had an emptiness. But what we're building is a consciousness that is actually going to bring together all of these stories of having been hollowed out to finally awaken with a mind that was not to get away from that difficulty, but to finally open with a greater mind that said, welcome, because I'm a tree. I don't want to leave. I just want to make sense of the emptiness. And that's a beautiful thing to think about for our humanity. I just wanted to know what to do with the emptiness. I think that's our arts. I really do. I think that's our music. What do I do with the despair? I'd love to just say it's all happy and whatnot, but what do you do? And I think that's the gift of mothership. She says, I want to show you that you blossom as the outcome of this journey of separation and sorrow. I want you to realize it was the ancestors and that you are the ancestors of this great vision that said that only as we, in a way, <laughs> cry ourselves through the ages, <laughs> will we finally understand what the tears of joy will mean. Because tears of joy are not personal. They're human. We stand up in those tears and we think, my God, I'm part of something unimaginable, mm -hmm. something beyond heroic, a willingness in a species to over and over again enter and say, I don't know, I don't know, and to never be rewarded for it, seemingly, mm -hmm. until we could stand in a library and understand we're the technology, we're the outcome of this great journey. And that the chalice then reveals itself again with the knowledge, the gift is life. And that the mother, as she shows herself here upside down, she said, I show you in male and female form the innocence of energy and uh, uh, form of love and thought. Because these are the two qualities that she says, do you see my hips become the head of the hummingbird? Here we see its beak, and now we will see the two wings that like the hummingbird, we're learning to achieve stillness while in motion. Helps us understand the tarot. It says, if you put me as a circle below you, and I'm spinning, think of me as a gyroscope. Think of me as that hummingbird. You can hold these conditions. You can be passionate about them, but you will always pull back to your magnetic center. And that's where she says, finally, we're home, stand with me. And the last is, I am the great mother. I am matter, mater, mother, the weave of all worlds. All are woven of me, all are born through me. 
I am the knowledge of your atoms. Your father, Adam, is the knowledge of your form. I love all of my children, all of my Adams and Adams and Eves, and give no one the right to brutalize any of them for any reason. There are no evil Adams. If you don't like your stories, tell better ones. Begin with the story you are telling yourself about who you think you are. You are the outcome of the gathering of the most noble question. What does it mean to be human? You wear the robes of the living library, your whole and holy DNA. You are blessed, you are home, you are loved, you are an art form of creation. You are the human form divine. Thank you very much. Thank you.